If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. And we have a new sound system, so that's where we're getting adjusted. So if you hear some background, we're still adjusting things back and forth. But I like this sound. It sounds a lot better. To me, it does anyway. So we are uh, in the season of what is called, the church says, Lent. And sometimes, uh, and actually I have actually said a mistake in saying that Lent was normally 40 days before Easter. But technically that's not correct. Okay. It's actually Lent, why Lent is recognized by the church and the church calendar uh, in the Catholicism and Episcopalians and Lutherans and things like this. Is in fact that Lent is actually the 40 days of when Jesus went into the wilderness, into the desert. There's actually 41 days now before Easter, I actually counted them. So that's where Lent comes from, because there was a, Christ was, uh, was fasting and, uh, he had, uh, and he was tempted during that time. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and let's rise as we read God's holy word. Please rise. <clears throat> All together we read. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, it shall give his angels over charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you, bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall not worship the Lord, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Amen. The word of the Lord from the book of Matthew. Please be seated. You know, we're going to begin a series right now that comes to this point as to, I'm calling this the path, path, to, the, path to the cross. Resurrection Sunday, of course, as I said, 41 days away, uh, several weeks away. But however, I felt it's very vital for our community to walk towards Calvary as we approach this time. In today's passage, we see that Jesus, who, hadn't, who had just been baptized and had received the blessings of the Father, being led into the desert. Jesus was not only led into, not led into the desert to have communion with the Father, according to Matthew 4. He was brought to this place to be tempted. Tempted. That word tempted can mean either I tempt or I test. In a sense, temptation and testing are the head and tail of, a, of, of the same coin. Of the same coin. The devil tempts and the father tests. A temptation is literally a trap that is meant to get us to go against the will of the Father. A test tries to get us to prove ourselves faithful to God's will according to God's scripture. Never, God never tempts anybody to do evil at all. In the book of James, James chapter 1 verse 13, it says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. You see, God will use circumstances to test our character and our faithfulness with the, the intent purpose of us solidly coming out, in other words, passing that particular test. You see, the point we see again is like also in, with Abraham. Abraham took Isaac to the mountaintop, Morad, and by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. You see, Satan is tempting Jesus to go contrary to the Father's will. Contrary to the Father's will. And at the end of Jesus' 40 days in the desert, the enemy attacks Jesus with three different types of temptation. Same ones he uses against us. Now Jesus, of course, we know, is tired, is hungry, is lonely. 
And we could say literally he stretched out physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Then it comes, then comes the temptations. Now, I want to speak just for a few moments about verse 1. There's a lot of contention about that. And it reads, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus clearly was tempted, was attempted to be tempted by the devil. But Jesus did not have what we call the inward vulnerability that you and I have to give in to temptation. Because the Bible says a man is tempted. A human is tempted when he is drawn away from there by their own desires. He is then enticed. You see, temptation, you see the tempter needs cooperation with the temptee, okay, for this to happen. And that would be us, okay, in that sense. And, and if that temptation was to work, we have desires and we want things that are being offered to us. And so the devil knows that it's how Jesus, that Jesus does not have this inward vulnerability. No. That combustible, sinful nature, as we say, that we all have as humans. We call this our old nature, our old man, our old clothes. Christ doesn't have that. You see, the enemy rarely makes a very frontal attack. Rather, he waits until we're sidetracked or, or distracted with something when we're weary and when we're weak. And that's why it seems that we become inundated all at one time. Everything is just piled onto us all at one time. He gets one punch to land, that is. And he immediately begins attacking on several different fronts to us. You see, temptation must be seen in the context of a testing because God is in control of both the tempter and the circumstances. And he will never allow a person to be tempted beyond what they can endure. Scripture tells us this. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide a way to, of escape also. So that you will, be, you will be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians. In other words, Satan doesn't tempt us without God knowing it. For example, let me give you a couple of examples. When Satan tempted Job to go to the contrary against the will of God. Satan attempted, tempted Job, but God was testing Job's faithfulness. Job passed with flying colors. In Joseph, in Genesis, you can see that. His brothers sold him into slavery. A satanic attack, as you can say. But God used those circumstances for good. Genesis 50, 20 says that. You see, a temptation in the hands of Satan turns into a test in the hands of God. A temptation in the hands of Satan turns into a test in the hands of God. You see, Jesus is on mission here to do the perfect will of the Father. The devil also too has a mission statement, if you want to say. And that is to get Jesus to go contrary, contrary to the Father's will. And at the end of the temptation, Satan's temptings fall, fail to achieve its goal. And Jesus passes that test, as we say, with flying colors. You see, it is, it is this testing that prepares Jesus, that prepares Jesus to be our high priest, one who understands everything that we're going through, un endures everything that we've been through. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, you should. Therefore, he had, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. So that he might become merciful and, and the faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in which he has suffered, he is able to, over, to come to the aid of those who are tempted. We have a great high priest in the name of Jesus who understands everything that we're going through. And many people will say, well, Pastor, I don't understand how Jesus can understand everything that I'm dealing with. He never had cancer. He never had this diagnosis. He never had this back issue. He never had under that. That's true. He never did. But he understands the pain and the agony. The pain and the agony that he took on that cross. He understands what it means to be separated 
from his family. He understands what it means for have, to have someone be there with him at that foot of the cross. You see, Jesus faced temptation as a man, not as the Son of God. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you play Xbox? How many have Xboxes? Yeah, only none of you old, old people, huh? Okay, a couple got Xboxes. Now, when I say this word, you probably have no clue, but these two youngsters right here, these young chickens over here, will know. When I say cheat codes, you know what cheat, what do you mean, yeah, over here? I'm not talking about your taxes. No. You know, cheat codes. Cheat codes are something that is you can find within the game that the way it was explained to me by my grandson that you can find that will give you additional abilities or get, extend your life, give you additional weapons if you're playing that type of game and those type of things like that. It's, it's when a player gets an, gets an advantage, right? He gets unlimited lives, ammo, Joggernauts and all the extra lives is ways explained to me. I had to write that down exactly the way he said it. <laughs> you see, Jesus didn't use cheat codes. None at all. None at all. He didn't use the cheat codes, quote, of his divinity to overcome the enemy. Satan wanted Jesus. Understand what I'm going to say. Satan wanted Jesus to, to cheat and to use his awesome superpower, his deity, to cheat on the test. But Jesus didn't. Jesus faced temptations the same way as you and I do, as ordinary people. Matthew 1.4 says, It is written, man, we don't have, we don't have those superpowers that God's, God has. We don't have the cheat codes. It wouldn't have been a big thing for Jesus just to wave and do it. He faced temptations with the same resources that we have at our disposal. Stay with me. It's called the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's words. Today we remember Jesus' lonely trial in the desert. We see how similar and different we are from Jesus in many ways. We too face temptations and tests, but we don't always do well as Jesus did when those temptations come. We don't always trust God's provision to provide for us. We put God to the test when we worship and serve other gods by putting things ahead of the one true God. In the Judean desert, we, see, we have front row seats, as we see in Scripture, of the first, literally, as we would say, my words, throw down between the two kingdoms that are there, between two figures who want to lay claim to the hearts and soul. Of mankind. That's what we're seeing right here. You see Jesus doesn't tuck tail and run. No. He advances the kingdom of God. And his mission. He engages the enemy. He engages Satan. And today we can identify with a man in this wilderness. By the name of Jesus. By looking at three temptations. Or tests that he endured. You see, my, my objective this morning is, that, is to see, is a hope that you can see how you too can overcome temptation by discovering how Jesus overcame temptation. Here's the first temptation. The first temptation was about the desire to serve others. We see that in Matthew verses 3 and 4. As it were, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones. Why was he being tempted to get a biscuit? Why was he tempted to get a biscuit? Satan was trying to get Jesus to demonstrate his power to get what he wanted. What Jesus wanted. To demonstrate his power. He wanted some food. Jesus was hungry. The Bible says that. He was hungry. He was tired. He was weary. When Jesus came to earth, he laid aside his own will to do the will of the Father. John 4.34, 6.38, Matthew 26, all it says that. And John 4.34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his works. To do his will and accomplish his works. John 6.38, 6, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of, will of him who sent me. 
Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 42. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. You see, we have to understand one thing. Even though Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus didn't do anything, didn't did anything. When Jesus did anything, that is, supernaturally, it was always at the prompting and the subjection of the Father. He always did it that way. He didn't do anything without the Father leading or approval. Getting a biscuit, literally, wasn't the issue. The issue was this. The same issue that we deal with. Breaking the trust and submission to the Father. Jesus had to do the Father's will. If he didn't, he would fracture the very nature of God. He would fracture that. I guess you could say that the Father's not going to feed you, as Satan would say, and that's all right. You don't need him. Just get your own bread. I'm sure Satan probably said in between the lines. But Jesus couldn't, couldn't pull that God card and still be in the perfect unison with the Father. You see, Jesus responded to that tempter with a very, with the very, with the power of the powerful word of Scripture out of Deuteronomy 8. He humbled humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Jesus is declaring very clear that we are better off to obey and and to depend upon the Father and wait for his provision and wait instead of us grabbing satisfaction. That's our problem in a lot of things. We want to hurry up and process and do things. But we need to understand what God is saying. We need to depend on God. And I believe, again, that that is why God is allowing us to go through. Because we are so independent, so self-centered in this church. Okay, you can throw stones at me later on. But I am saying that we need to be centered on God. And we need to be in His obedience. And we need to be dependent upon Him. Not dependent upon what you think, what I think, or anybody else thinks. We need to be dependent upon God and obey what God desires for us to do. Then, then God will provide. He'll provide. We can't just grab at anything that we want. I'm not saying that things were, you know. I'm just saying is that, beloved, let's focus on what God wants us to do. And that's to be obedient and submissive to him. And to wait on him. If we live by faith in him. And in his obedience and in his word. We will never lack anything we really need. That's a fact. In Philippians 4.19 it says. that, And my God will supply all your needs. According to his riches. In glory in Christ. When Christ is not in the center. When Christ is not being preached. When Christ is not in the center of this whole church. When Christ is not here. Guess what happens? You might as well go to Las Vegas. We might as well. Matthew 6, 8 says this. So do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. Before you even ask him. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom. His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We are always better off to obey God and to trust in His gracious provision than to impatiently provide a self-centered providing for ourselves in the ways that we want that are disobedient to God and disobedient to His Word. And when we compromise God's Word and when we compromise our position with God and when we say we only like God on Sunday or when He provides for us, We wonder why things don't go right. When we get in trouble, it's when we do things that that we, you know, we want to please God. Lord, show me the things that I want you to do, that I need to do to get back in your will. 
Show me those things. You know, the center motive in our lives should be this. One of the things, and I think I've shared this with you before, when I come up and when we take of the offerings, I will stop for a moment and I will turn and I will look at that cross. And I say these simple words and I will say these words every time. And when I take, when I'm privileged enough to take a pulpit, Lord, the words that have come out of my mouth, let them be pleasing to you. Allow me to please you. I'm not here to please you. My job is to please the Lord. And I hope that's what you would desire to do. When we fail to please the Lord by doing our own things, when we fail to please Him by trusting Him, when we fail to please Him by being obedient to Him, what do you expect? When your children were being raised, you as the parent, when you told your child something and that child was disobedient, did you reward that child? How many of you did? No takers, huh? No. You corrected that child with love. You didn't hate your child. You corrected that child. Beloved, we need to understand that our Father loves us that much. That He will do that. He loves us that much. While we're out of our, in our disobedience, he'll wait. Are you done? Are you done? Are you done? When we don't wait upon him and don't rush and push and push into things and allow him, to allow the Lord to come in time through his way, through his purpose, and we don't allow temptation to satisfy our own needs. And the test is to have faith in God that God will meet our needs. Our greatest need is not solved by clothes, food, shelter. Our greatest need is spiritual. Our greatest need is there. Our greatest goal in life is not how much we acquire, but rather that we bring glory to God, the one true God. Amen? Here's the second temptation. The second temptation was to test God. Matthew 4, 5, and 6 says that very clearly. Satan, after tempting Jesus with a biscuit, he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, probably about 500 foot or so above the Kidion Valley. On top of this grand temple tower, Satan says, you are the son of God. Jump. And the devil, devil even gets out, quote, scripture, and says this out of Psalm 91. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard all your ways. They will bear you in their hands that you do not strike your foot. Wrong. That's not what he said. Jesus, if you believe what scripture says, then jump. Put your money where your mouth is. Jump. You notice as I said, Satan didn't quote the whole scripture in that passage. He left out one important line. To guard you in all your ways. He admitted that in a statement to him. He, he admitted that. And I believe that when a child of God is in the will of God, the Father will protect him. The Father will protect him. He watches over all those who are in his ways. Who are in his ways. Jesus, like before, quotes scripture right to the tempter. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And I believe that there are two key reasons Jesus refused to take part of this spectacle, such as throwing himself off the temple roof. One, it was a sensationalism that Satan wanted. The second is to test God. To test God was to doubt God. Had Jesus put his father to the test, he would have separated himself from the father and perverted that divine power of redemption. That plan 
a power of redemption. The very purpose for which he had left heaven was to accomplish that. The redemption of you and me. If Jesus, who was perfect, didn't feel comfortable putting God to the test, then why in the heck should we try to put God to the test? Who are we? No. Do we feel we have the right to test God? No, we do not. To live recklessly and carelessly and then expect God to bail us out when we get in trouble is to pursue, is to pre presume on the grace that has been showed to us. Romans, Paul says this in Romans 6, what shall I do? Since grace abounds, shall I continue to sin? Paul says that. The point is this. If you're a diabetic who refuses to take insulin and argues the point and argues that Jesus will take care of me, you may be tempting the Lord. Be very blunt. Anytime we try and force God to contradict his word is to test him. It's to test him. When we put him to the test to fulfill our own ambition, he gives no promise on which you or I can rest. No promise at all. And those who are willing to put, him, put themselves in the way of danger and temptation often end up blaming God when harm comes to their foolish ways. Case in point, Garden of Eden. Adam did what? He blamed God. God, you gave me this woman here. It's your fault, God. Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> mean, yep. We see that. Let's not blame God for our, quote, stupid mistakes. Shall I say that? Yeah. When we risk our prestige, money, lies, family, or anything else to fulfill God's calling, we can rest confidently in his divine provision for all that we need. If we accept the truth that he knows what we really need. We must never, never divorce one part of Scripture from another part of Scripture. And that is what Satan did. We must compare spiritual things with spiritual things. Very clearly. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 says this. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual Exactly. It is important that we read all scripture and study all God's words to say what it says. For all of it is profitable for the daily life. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that very clear. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for the teaching, for the reproving, for the correction, for the training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Know his word. Know God's holy word. Start claiming what he says to do. Don't take my word. Read it. The third temptation was worshiping Satan. Worshiping Satan. Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4 verses 8 through 10 says that. Satan knew that sometime in the future that every knee would bow, tongue would confess at the name of Jesus. So he offered Jesus, think about it this way, he offered Jesus a shortcut, a shortcut that didn't run through Calvary. If Jesus would have bowed and worshiped Satan just once, just once, that's, that's the original force of the language, that Jesus could enjoy all the glory without the suffering. All the glory without the suffering. Satan had always wanted worship because he wanted to be God. We can see that in the Old Testament in Isaiah 14. He wanted to be God. You see, worshiping the creature instead of the, the creator is, is, a, is the lie. Is the lie that the world rules our society today. Romans 1, 
24 through 25 says this, Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their, of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creatures, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Beloved, that is what is happening in our society today, where it is saying it is okay to do these things. It is okay if you are satisfied. It is okay if you live this lifestyle. It it is okay because it's your own thing. It doesn't affect anybody. It's for you only. That's the lie of the world. That's the lie of the world. Do what your own thing. Do what you got to do. God's word is very clear though, isn't it? You see, the Lord replied in Deuteronomy 16, he says, You shall fear only the Lord your God. And you shall worship him and swear by his name. You notice that uh, Satan didn't say a thing about serving him, did it? Not a word about serving him. He just wanted Jesus to worship him. Not to serve him. I always found that kind of strange. Jesus knew that whatever you and I worship, that is what we will serve. If you worship the almighty daughter, dollar, that is what you will serve. If you worship your credentials behind your name, that is what you will serve. But if you worship the Lord your God, there are so many things that will come from there. As I said, Satan didn't say anything about service. Serving him. He didn't. Because once you begin to worship something, you begin serving that. The Bible says very clearly that we can't have two masters, right? We can't. When you begin worshiping the almighty dollar, when you begin worshiping almighty families, when you begin worshiping all of that, hmm, that begins to take over. Luke 4.13 says this, when the, devil, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. He didn't give up, didn't quit. Because we can see that later on. That's when he tempted Peter to abandon the cross. You see that in Matthew 16. When Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer the things that are there. And that he would be persecuted. Peter stood up and he said, God forbid it, Lord. That shall never happen to you. And Christ turned around and looked Peter square in the eyes. That's what he should do to many of us. And say this. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting yourself, you're setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. And through the crowd that had been fed, Satan tempted Jesus again with the easy kingdom. Seeing the multitudes that were there. John 16, 15 says that. So Jesus perceived that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him a king. And Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. You see, beloved, what, what we're seeing right here in the temptation is the same temptations that are listed in the first John. The pride of life. The eyes of life. The lust of the flesh. The same three that Jesus faced, we face. That will always be there. But beloved, we need to face those things as to how Jesus did. And as the praise team comes forward to prepare, I want us to stop and to think about it as we take this path to Calvary. Take the steps to Calvary. And as we begin looking at the 40 days that are here, Lord, let me be in your will. 
And I shared with you before, as it says very clearly in Scripture, when believers ask, I want to know the will of Father for me, the will of the Father is to worship me. Is to worship Him. So when we think about this, and the crowd at Calvary, if you're the Son of God, save yourself. Save yourself. Save yourself. We don't have cheat codes. We have God's Word. We have God's holy word. Which if we study, if we use, we will find how powerful that is for our life. Amen? Amen. So in the days as we prepare for the coming of Resurrection Sunday, let's stop and ask ourselves, am I serving you, Lord? Or am I serving the world? Am I being tempted, Lord, by the material things of this world? Or am I seeking your will? Oh, so easy as the world says. But eternity with you is the blessings that's truly there. Your love that you have for us is surpassed anything that we could ever understand. By Jesus' faithfulness, to the Father. He went to that cross at Calvary so long ago. So long ago. For us. Because He loves us. I think it's a great time for us right now to refocus our attention. Get away from all of the distractions of, distractions of everything that's ongoing and focus upon Jesus. And the love of God. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads for a moment. And just ask the Father. Ask the Lord Jesus. To help us and to guide us each and every day. For his love will always be there. Lord, let us be in your will. Let us always focus upon you. For you are truly gracious. Truly awesome. And thank you for that. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Let us rise, please. The love of God is greater far than tongues or pain can ever fail. It goes beyond the highest star. a few moments and let's pray for each other. Let's pray for our church. And let's pray that we can be in God's will. That we can trust and we can be obedient and we can place Christ back in the center. Amen? Amen. Let's pray out loud, all in one loud voice. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hands and let's pray for pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you, O oh Lord, that who you are. And Lord, we lift up this church to you now. We lift the Lord, your church that you created is so long for your purpose and for your glory. We desire, Lord, to be in your will. We desire, Lord, 
to do the things that you call us to do. We desire, Lord, to worship you, uh, worship you alone. Lord, we want your blessings back to be upon this church. We desire for your hand to be there. We desire, Lord, that you prepare our hearts, Lord. Remove those things, Lord, that might have blocked us. Remove all of those things, Lord. That stumbling block that is there. Let us worship you, Lord, all of our days of life. Let it always be there, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the promises that you give us. And Lord, let us always, always, the love of God, the love of God. The love of God, how rich and pure, I measure and strong. Yes, Lord, we thank you for that love that we have heard today, Lord. And that's how Jesus was tempted in that wilderness so long ago. Those temptations, Lord, still exist today. For Satan will try everything, Lord. We do not give authority. We do not give anything to Satan, Lord. For, Lord, we give you all the worship, all the glory, all the power, Lord. For you truly are the one and true God. Lord, bless us as we leave today, Lord. Fill us with your grace and your mercy. Fill us with your love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us all the days of our life. Amen. 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 Thank you all.